Hello and welcome to the Wellness Musketeers podcast, where we discuss and inform on matters relating to health, wellness, fitness topics, and even some current events as well. I'm your host, Aussie Mike James, a freelance writer and speaker with over 30 years of international experience managing leading corporate fitness centers in Australia and in Washington, D.C. with the World Bank Group. Joining me today is my fellow musketeer, Dr. Richard Kennedy. Welcome, Richard. Thank you, Michael. Dr. Kennedy is an internist who has over 36 years of clinical experience, including the World Bank Clinical Services and private practice. Now, our very special guest today is professional actor and standardized patient, Katie Culligan. Since 2008, Katie has simulated hundreds of medical conditions and cases to help medical students learn how to diagnose and communicate effectively with patients. Think about the importance of bedside manner by your doctor. Katie and her colleagues help doctors learn how to be better doctors. So today we're going to dive into the who, what, where, and why of this quirky industry that not many people have heard of standardized patients. In fact, my only real recollection, if I can call it that, was a, a Kleinfeld episode called The Burning. Um, and I'm sure Katie's been reminded of this over the years. And in this episode, Kramer and his friend Mickey Abbott get an acting gig playing sick patients for medical students, and they're assigned gonorrhea and bacterial meningitis, respectively, only on Seinfeld. <laughs> so again, I'm pretty sure Katie's been reminded of that episode over the years. Now, Katie's on the staff at Jordan Medical School and has worked at seven different medical schools and several other simulation programs. She's a James Madison University alumni, a stage and film actor, certified fitness trainer, group exercise instructor, wife, and most importantly, mother to a toddler. Welcome, Katie. Thank you so much for having me. Hi. Okay, Katie, we're going to start and... First question I'd like to ask you is, can you explain to our audience what exactly it means to be a standardized patient and how you came to be a standardized patient practitioner? Sure. Yes. What it means to be a standardized patient is basically med schools hire actors or some semblance of actors often who are paid, typically sometimes volunteer, to be portraying patients with certain ailments. So it could be anything from, ow, my stomach hurts to I'm getting some bad news and I, oh my goodness, I, you're telling me I have cancer. So anything that runs the gamut of that to med students all over the country, depending on the simulation program. And we, as standardized patients, basically evaluate those med students and give them feedback, sometimes verbal feedback, sometimes written feedback. But we are here to help them understand how it feels, what they did in their encounter with us, how it feels to be in our shoes as their patient. That's so, great. That is a yeah. great answer. And a little side note to this, I, I went to medical school in Pittsburgh. Ah. And, and one of the interesting things was Initially, they had us while we were learning to interview patients and things like that. They did have, I called the models mm -hmm. and then portray a patient, and a particular condition, et cetera. And we were all evaluated based on that. So this actually is refreshing to see that the one is still doing it. Yeah, that's awesome. Yes. And also for the same... The, the main reason, and, and we'll probably talk about it a little bit later, is that bedside manner is critical. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's critical. But moving on, so, how many different types of cases or encounters have you been involved with? And what is the range of the medical conditions that the practice of standardized patients includes? And what does a typical con encounter consist of? So, <laughs> um, I, the question is like, how many different types of cases have I been involved with? So many, <laughs> I don't think I could actually quantify that because I've just over the years done so many, some, <laughs> it feels like a million times, some I've only done once, but mm -hmm. like I had mentioned earlier, it runs the gamut. I've played patients who have 
It's more about what's going on in their head. How are they interacting with the world around them and the med student or the doctor versus patients that are literally just like, I'm in pain, please help me. Like I'm coming in because I have this pain and it's all about the physical ailment. I want you to treat me well, but also please help me because I'm in acute pain. So that's, I've just done so many. And the range truly is, if you can think of it, I'm, there's a chance I portrayed something in the realm of that. And I, I realized I didn't answer your question earlier, how I got into it. So just to backtrack, I was in a show with a wonderful actor. And she said, I, I hope to never have a day job again, meaning like a non-acting job. <laughs> and I said, how, how do you do that? And she, because I was just out of college and she mm -hmm. was like, I do these role playing things. And some of them are, a lot of them are standardized patient work. And so she and another castmate sent me some resources and said, these are the ones I work with. Remember, if you go in an audition or reach out to them, remember, I'm reflected in this too. So please be professional. Please show up. Do that, of course. Yeah. And ever since then, I've never looked back. It's such a cool industry that like in their right, it doesn't feel like a day job because you're you do get paid to act and you also get to learn a lot about med school. And I, I know so much more from doing it. So anyway, just wanted to, to touch base on that. Yeah, it's it sounds like an exciting endeavor. If I was younger, I'd consider doing it myself. Hey, <laughs> you could do it now. That's the best part is if you wanted to, you would bring a lot to the table. You don't have to be a young. It's not a young person's game. They need People from all walks of life, yeah. ages, everything. Yeah, yeah. Though I know you're a doctor, so you're probably busy. <laughs> well, we'll have to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but how do you prepare for a typical encounter? What kind of information and detail are you given? And what kind of feedback do you give physicians, medical students afterwards? Yes. So prepare. Preparation for this encounter, or any encounter, it can be very different depending on the encounter or the school or who you're portraying. Sometimes it is literally, I get a paragraph. This is like the most like hands off. It'll be like, you are this name, this age, you're upset because you're having this pain or the shortness of breath and something in that nature where it's very much like we have to improv a lot of it. But some, and I would say a lot of encounters that I've done are very highly trained and detail oriented. It might be a packet of like 20 pages of information mm -hmm. that we, <laughs> it can be overwhelming. But then not only do we have to read it ahead of time, and sometimes we get paid to read it at home and prepare for it if, if we're lucky. But then we go into a training that can be hours long with a group of standardized patients sometimes online, a lot of times in person, and we ask questions and we go through it. And then we even do a, a mock mm -hmm. encounter, like just a little bit so people can put it on the feet, ask questions. And then we go and do the encounter and, and we do it a bunch of times, maybe on, on a different day or a different week. So it really depends on a lot of factors of how much work we put into it, which can be it can be awesome and it can be challenging depending on your personality and skill set <laughs> of how they're different. Yeah, it sounds, it, it actually sounds like a lot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is. It, it is a lot. Uh, <laughs> a lot. And, and you asked also about what kind of information and detail are you given and what kind of feedback do you give to physicians, med students afterwards? This is our favorite part typically about standardized patient work is being able to give feedback to people who are ideally open to hearing it. And so we often, very often we have the ability and opportunity to give feedback in some way. So whether it's written, as I mentioned earlier, like online, they get to read it later. Or my favorite is verbal where the encounter ends, the patient, sorry, the med student leaves the room and then they come back and I say, hey, so my name is actually Katie. And would you be open to hearing some feedback from my perspective as your patient? And that way we get to really have a nice rapport. So when you 
said this thing, it made me feel a little unsure of where the encounter was going. Perhaps if you had done this thing, I might have felt a little bit more reassured. And and oftentimes we often sandwich that with positive feedback. <laughs> when you shook my hand when you walked into the room and gave me strong eye contact, I felt confident. So we try to make sure that our feedback is specific and measurable. So meaning that rather than just being like, that was great, you did great. It's like, mm-hmm. Cool. But how can we tell them like, when you do the specific behavior, it made me feel generally good in some way, shape or form or generally bad. And here's how it made me feel bad. And here's how what might have made me feel better or just I don't even know the answer to what might have made it better. But I do know that this is how it affected me. So that's the cool thing about feedback that we get to be specific and we, we are often asked to to give them feedback. Oh, great. That, that's actually really good. And that leads to this next question, which is to me interesting. Do you play patients of all ages and mm-hmm. at simultaneously, because you're a woman, do they also ask you to play the role of an older man, maybe, or a younger man, Mm -hmm. a particular condition? And if so, if the answer is yes, what does that do to the encounter? Yeah, that's a great question. So yes, the answer to that is I've played all different types of ages and a few different types of genders, honestly, like Mm -hmm. very rare that I'm asked to play a man. But for some types for formative, meaning like learning opportunities, not a not an examination. Typically, I wouldn't be playing someone that's so out of my my role. But for something that you're helping teach these students. So right now we're going to do this example case and you're going to be playing this 58 year old man who's coming in with chest pain because he just ate five guys burgers. But it might be something different. So then the students have to differentiate is, okay, is it heartburn? Or is he actually have, he has some past medical history of like heart issues. Should we take it seriously? And is he having a heart attack? So that type of thing can be just more used as a tool rather than we don't believe you (laughs) that this woman is playing the 58 year old man. Like they just have to get over it. And that's often the case with all the things. It's like we, we can only do and look like what we look like. Sometimes we put on certain wardrobes that make us lean into a certain thing but I have played a lot of female characters for sure and but I've played different age ranges I once played like an 86 year old who and again this was a formative event where they're learning and the students walk out of the room and when they come back into the room like they they typically know me as Katie and all of a sudden I'm like this woman who can barely function like they have to move my body to get because she's all out of it and so those can be fun because it throws the students for a loop. However, I will say that just regarding type, if I am being asked to do an examination, Mm -hmm. I am often asked to do something close to my type. It may not, I might, I might be like, okay, you're 50 years old. Okay. I I am not 50 years old, but I'm a 50, I could enough portray a 50 year old woman or like you're 20 years old. I'm not 20 years old. Wish I was, Mm -hmm. but I could still somewhat believably be that whereas like when I've been asked to play a 14 year old girl that's a little bit I've done it (laughs) or a three-year-old done it that's a huge stretch but they just have to understand that we're not here for the believability because you're not going to get the same type of education if you actually had a three-year-old a real three-year-old they wouldn't be able to communicate (laughs) feedback Yes. Um, you're going to understand the process of what we're doing. So the last thing to your question, though, is specific symptoms, visible conditions that I don't have. This is a huge, great question, because if there are fluid in the lungs, let's say, and of course, I would be very lucky to say I wouldn't have fluid in my lungs typically. Mm-hmm. But I have to portray a case that day that let's say my character has fluid in her lungs. What would happen is If they say, okay, I'm going to listen to your lungs now, and they do it, and then after they've done it, I will give them a card that says fluid in right lung on back or Mm -hmm. whatever. Or Mm -hmm. we've even had the opportunity sometimes to use a thing called ventriloscope. Sorry, ventriloscope. Yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah, they, they can like, and we would say, 
when you're, this is what you would hear when you do that. Or even without the card or the ventriloscope, it would say, I would just say, and you would hear the fluid in my, you know, left lower base of the lung, something like that. That's the least common one that we have to verbalize it, but that can be on the table. So basically we have to set aside, like just, it's almost a little timeout without totally breaking character. And we say, and this is what you would hear. And then we go back into character. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I know. Wild, right? <laughs> oh, good. That's it. Yeah. When you think it, it and it makes you think of because you could pretty much pick any health condition, be it mental or physical. And I suspect you can make it very basic mm-hmm. or it could be relatively complex. And I'd ask what was in your experience, what has been the most complex patient experience you've had to portray? Oh my goodness. That's a really good and challenging question because it depends on what type of complexity. I've done a case that was very much like I, it, I was barely acting in it. Like it was all about the students had to come in and they had to use a bunch of tools and mm-hmm. there was a fake arm sitting in the room. We're, we're sitting there, but we have a checklist. Mm-hmm. And they have to learn how to <laughs> drill an IV or something into yeah. the arm. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. But and of course, they're not using our real arm because, ouch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> but that is a very complex thing that we had to learn. and be. But, and, but at the same time, we're sitting there being like, I'm crashing. Go. <laughs> and do they do the thing? Okay, they brought the thing over. They did it. Yeah, we... Did the blood spurt out? Okay, so we're checking the boxes of that. So that's complex in one way. But there's Mm -hmm. also been complex, more character-based cases. And some of them, the complexity is, I think I mentioned earlier, the some of the cases are like 20 pages long, and they have such a really detailed, excuse me, detailed backstory. And we have a lot of lines that we have to say verbatim, word for Mm -hmm. word. So it'll be like, a paragraph. And then if they ask this question, I have to say this line. And so that can be complex and just as an actor or a person memorizing and making sure that I say it so it's standardized. Okay. Yeah. And we can give our own flavor to how we say those things. But yeah. the more we are expected to say specific things in a case, like if it's a quantity, that's just, that can be really complex. And sometimes it's, I, my hobby is to read to to read Agatha Christie novels or something like that. And it's do we, does that, do we need to know this information? Like <laughs> when we're trying to learn everything else in this case, do we really need to know that is the type of novel that we're reading when most likely it's not going to come up? Um, yeah. Or... Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just funny. But yeah, it's and that, like, once again, some people are going to like those complex cases more. Some like it where we don't have to memorize as much, but that means you got to use a lot more improv skills of bringing your whatever to the table and having that being neutral when you need to, but then also being just off the cuff, really there and present in the moment so you don't go the wrong route or send them the wrong route. Yeah. Yeah. I know that's a long answer to your question, but... (laughs) Yeah, but it sounds like what it needs to be because it, it medicine is challenging. It yeah. you you have to be able to think, and uh, you have to be able to think on your feet. Uh, yeah, and yes. you cannot. I learned very early in my career the best doctors are the ones who, by the time you have finished your interview with the patient before you've put your hands on them, 95% of the time, you should have a pretty good idea what's going on. If you haven't, you didn't listen. Ah. Which means you then didn't ask the right questions based on what they were telling you. That makes complete sense. And I love hearing that from a doctor's perspective. So that's really wonderful. Did you ever work with standardized patients? Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When I was in Pittsburgh and then when I was in New York at Columbia, yeah. And you, what you found was that some people were very believable of the roles they were playing. 
Yeah. That you we, I remember, distinctly remember this. She was actually 67 in real life and she was playing someone who was 25 <laughs> who ended up having acute appendicitis. Mm-hmm. And we were, the questions, she was, she's in the emergency room and she's trying to describe her pain, which of course at that time was very atypical. It wasn't a classic pain. It wasn't in the right place of the abdomen that you typically expect to see it. Mm -hmm. And, but she kept giving clues to the students and it was fascinating to see only one of the three picked up on it. Oh, yeah. Question, which meant that person was listening and it had a lot to do with it. So she was very believable because a lot of people, you get people get confused when they see physically a person who looks one way. Right. But portraying something else, it's hard for them to to disconnect what's in front of them and put in place what they would expect to see if it was a person who really presented that way. Yeah, absolutely. I believe that a huge thing and helps teach students, first of all, to, to get a poker face and to come across as non-judgmental. But also, I imagine out in the real world, you may not see that exactly, but you might still expect to see one thing and then you're encountering something else in the room. And it's probably really important to keep oh, yeah. uh, a neutral face, right? To not let that throw you so then they don't say, hey, I felt judged by this doctor. I'm not going back to this doctor. I don't trust them now. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And you said something very early on. But when you just said, uh, when you mentioned walking in the room and shaking the hand of the per- person who's going to be providing care to you, if that person was shaking your hand and looking down at the floor or looking over to the right or the left, gives a totally different impression to the patient. Yeah. Who's coming for something. Yes. Whatever it is, they're coming for something. And if you're not there, I always say, this is something I learned from my mom. She used to say, when you're in the room with people, be present. Mm, so true. So true. And that's true in real life, but even more so in, in medicine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I love hearing that. Thank you for sharing. And I, so I'm curious, so because you work with standardized patients, have, has it helped you like as a doctor? Was that something that brought anything I, to your skills? I think it has more because you, as you observe and watch, you learn to look back on your own experiences. Mm-hmm. Because you know, medicine is pretty basic. The same diseases that existed 2,000 years ago are the same ones today. The only difference is we have more tools to get access to the answers. Yeah. But the history and the physical are still the most important. And it gets reinforced with that. Mm-hmm. Standardized patient has been, now you need people who are have a willingness. And just like in every other discipline in life, you have some people who are all in to what they're doing. And there are Mm -hmm. people who basically are talented enough, smart enough, gifted enough that they can skate the surface. And it works until you get that. And I always say other dilemma is it works until you get that one patient who really needs you to be present Mm. And you miss something and it has dire consequences for that individual. Yeah. You know, the one thing is it's one thing to, to miss, to miss a pitch in in a baseball game. And it's another thing to miss an important point that leads to someone's demise. That could have been a. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Life or death. Yeah. It's much big deal. Yeah, that's so true. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, so uh, do, and when you're giving the feedback to them, mm-hmm. do you, do you give them 
critiques on the, the best way to go forward. In other words, you can give positive criticism, mm -hmm. uh, but somewhere, but it should always be a learning experience, something because technically none of us ever does it perfect. Sure. Now, yeah. No matter what people say, we never really do it perfectly. And yeah. so what role does this standardized patient play in helping them? Yeah, it, I think it's so cool uh, that we do play a huge role because every, even standardized patients, of course, like we can be standardized in how we're taught and we portray the case, but as humans and when we're giving feedback, we're saying me as, as this patient, Monica, I felt, Katie felt, and my experience might be very different than, let's say, if you were portraying that same case, that you might have preferences or uh, things that you don't like that happened that I was like, actually, that was perfectly fine. It didn't bother me one way or the other. So what's really cool is we get to give not only um, general feedback of when you ask this open-ended question, it allowed me to give you an open-ended a lot of information that's more kind of like checklist but communication style feedback but then to be like when you said this one thing i i felt xyz and that again my, that's from my experience as katie as the patient rather than dr kennedy's experience as the patient you might have been like no i actually felt it didn't make me feel one way or the other or vice versa so I think that's what's so cool is that we get to bring a human subjective perspective of, of how it went in that moment. Because the same student, med student, could do the same exact case to another person. And maybe because they were able to learn from me or take something away, now they can do it a little bit better or a little bit stronger. Maybe better is not the right word, but for the next mm -hmm. patient and be more present might be one of it. Because that certainly is feedback we give. But we also do try to give, as I mentioned before, specific feedback. So it's very much like one of my favorite things to ask my students after a feedback session in verbally is I'll say the things that I felt were good or the, specifically and then something that they could work on. Sometimes a few things that they could work on. I try to be tactful. We do try mm -hmm. to be tactful and professional about sure. it. Um, sure. But I often say, OK, so before you leave, after if you have any questions about it, anything else, and then I'll say, what's something that you learned from our feedback session today that you can would like to put into your next encounter? Mm -hmm. And it helps them say this specific thing I would like or plan on trying for the next one. And that's really cool because you can see them put it together and you hope that they use it. Who knows if they do yeah, for the next cool. encounter. Cool. But it's uh, yeah. Yeah. So that's one of my favorite parts about it. Oh, that's good. Do they, do you videotape, are you videotaped and then do they have access to the videotapes going forward? Yeah, so we are often videotaped in the encounter rooms, off, mm -hmm. not all the time, but in the encounter rooms, there are several cameras all around. Mm -hmm. There are microphones, not like mm -hmm. in our faces, but they they pick up. Right. And oftentimes we are recorded. Therefore, people such as the students or preceptors, doctors, mentors, professors can watch it either in real time from an observation room or after the fact so they can then see their work there. OK, so see, when you did this one thing, that's why they you missed asking this question. That's why they when they filled out this evaluation, you were you didn't get credit that it can be a, that type of a thing, too a backup mm -hmm. to be like, because again, we, a standardized patient or simulated patients, we are not perfect either. Of course, like we can work mm -hmm. really hard to be present and remember everything, but in an examination scenario, which is where this comes into play, there are times where, wait, did they ask if I have a family history of heart disease? Oh my gosh, this is my mm -hmm. sixth encounter today. And what, did they ask it or did the last person ask it? So yeah. those are the times when it's really beneficial to, we can go back and rewatch the recording after the fact and okay. have that backup. But a lot of times it's really just for that. It's not, they don't show it to the world. It's not sure, public. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's a very private, secure, but it is often recorded. Yeah. 
Yeah, it should be a learning experience on both ends, actually. Absolutely. Oh, it, it's it, and and part of it is, I think, for a lot of people, particularly those going into medicine who've never really had any experience as a patient themselves and really have not, they're now all of a sudden you go from being a student to where someone one day after you graduate on July 1, basically someone's going to call you Dr. So, and you're the, you walk in the room and the person in front of you expects you to be that doctor. And yes. so it, it can be somewhat nerve wracking if mm-hmm. you're not prepared. That's why as they like almost everything else practice does make us better. May not make us perfect because there's nobody on the planet that way, but we should be right. able to be close. As they always say, practice makes progress, right? There you go. There you go. <laughs> I love that saying because it's so true. You it's so- it. How... Has your experience as a standardized patient helped you to be a better actor? If 100%. so, yeah. And and what would you say that these encounters are basically a form of? Where is it an improvisation exercise? Is it, it it's real world in the sense that they, it, you can mimic the actual conditions that people might have, and so therefore be a learned experience. So when that medical student, soon-to-be doctor, actually is on the other side where it really counts, it will make a difference. Yeah, it's definitely made me a better actor because you're, it's almost like film acting a little bit because it's a little more nuanced. You're not making this sweeting, but it's not huge. It's all very intimate, one-to-one. Sometimes a couple different doctors are in there, a couple different patients, but it's very specific and nuanced and we have to be realistic. That's the goal. We even if we're not playing someone who we are exactly like, we still want to be as realistic as possible so they can then treat us realistically too. Yeah. So it's helped me definitely with my improv skills, but also just, yeah, as an actor, it's definitely helped me tie in to my emotions. Like of when we do challenging cases where we have to get upset or cry, we're getting bad news to go with what we're feeling rather than pushing tears or pushing we have to figure out, oh, the doctor or the way that the med student is talking to me is making it's is making me feel so supported and heard that actually I'm getting more upset in a good way. Like it's helping me release rather than, oh, they're very detached and cold and how they're delivering this news. I'm just going to shut down and I'm going to be angry. So like it and you feel it. And so that has been a huge emotional exercise when I've done those cases. And also sometimes just be learning how to be neutral and do no harm. Don't, as I mentioned earlier, don't send them down a detour where they're going to spend the next 20 minutes asking about your drinking when it's, no, this person doesn't have a drinking problem. Like they came in because they have stomach pain. Whereas a, a standardized patient, if they were just improving and said, yeah, I drink five drinks every single night, all liquor. Obviously, the doctor is going to be like, okay, why don't we talk about that? When it's, that's not important to it. Like, like, why did you, right. that's. Yeah. So I I hope that answers the question. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, Katie, you've created a podcast series called the Standardized Patients Podcast. I understand that as a guest, you have been featured on Conan O'Brien's podcast. What made you decide to start this podcast and what topics do you cover? So we, my podcast partner, Catherine Bublack, and I decided to start this podcast called the Standardized Patients Podcast. Before I was featured on Conan O'Brien's podcast, believe it or not, that was just a happy, wonderful surprise. But we started the podcast, I think we recorded almost all of our season one in late summer, fall of 2021. And the reason that we decided to do it is because I had this big experience being a standardized patient. and we realized that there were no other podcasts about standardized patient work. There were a couple episodes of podcasts here and there that focused on some standardized patient work, but in a very oversaturated market as podcasts are these days, it was really refreshing to realize, wait, there is not a podcast that is just about standardized patients that is currently happening. And I have a lot of experience as a standardized patient. I have a 
large network of standardized patients and et cetera that I have not only worked with a lot, but also are friends with. And so we reached out to different people and garnered interest in seeing if they'd be willing to come on our podcast. And if so, what would they be willing to talk about? And we had so many subjects that we wanted to cover that we realized we needed a season two. So we're doing season two right now. And who knows if there'll be a season three, but there really is so much to talk about that we haven't even covered yet. That's where we decided it was worth making a podcast. So we knew it would be a niche audience, <laughs> but we figured between other standardized patients, people that want to get into the work, people that want to learn about standardized patient work, people that are curious about odd jobs, day jobs as an actor or med students, doctors, et cetera, people in the health medical field. I thought it would be a, a really good hub for people to come learn about this line of work because it is fascinating and I think it's fascinating and which is a good thing considering I'm the host <laughs> of it. But to just touch on the Conan O'Brien podcast, I had reached out to them because they were open to hearing from fans. And I told them a little bit about myself and I put in that I was a standardized patient and I thought that might be a cool thing if if they were interested and they were interested. And so I was really excited to get an email from Team Coco <laughs> to ask would I be interested for a pre-interview and then got me on for an actual interview. And it was just wild and exciting that that brought standardized patient work to a whole nother platform because his audience is huge and people that don't even care about what we do, they still will listen to that podcast because he's funny. And they like what he brings to the table. So it was a really cool opportunity. And I'm still pinching myself that it happened. But but it's just funny that after that, the following March was when we released our podcast. <laughs> and it had nothing to do with that podcast that I was on. It just happened to be a, a really cool coincidence. So long-winded answer, but that is the answer <laughs> to those questions. Thank you, Katie and Dr. Kennedy, for such a very informative discussion on standardized patients. And hopefully we now all have much more information on the area of standardized patients than an old Seinfeld episode. And thank you for joining us at Wellness Musketeers. Tune in for upcoming episodes to gain the tools to improve your health, work performance, and live with a greater understanding of the world we experience together. Please subscribe, give us a five-star review, and share this recording with your family, friends, and colleagues. You can make a contribution through a link provided in our program notes to allow this podcast to grow. Let us know what you need to learn to help you live your best life. Send your questions and ideas for future episodes to Dave Liss at davidmliss at gmail.com. Mm -hmm.